Cameras live in three, two, one. Welcome everyone, welcome and thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. I think we are in for an extraordinary, beautiful moment of profound listening. Um, I want to thank all of those who have been behind the scenes helping this happen. Um, and also primarily Pat for giving us space to be able to receive from you. I know you're in huge demand at the moment, every which way. And so it really matters that you've carved out the time here for us. And for our listeners, um, Alison Sudol and Wendy Tan White and Daniel Growald, thank you also for being here and lending us your ears and your heart. So I'm gonna start just with an introduction to Pat and our listeners, and then just give you a slight bit of context as to what we're doing here. So this, uh, this is a listening session for Pat McCabe, also known as Women's Dance Shining. She is a Diné Navajo mother, grandmother, activist, artist, writer, ceremonial leader, and an international speaker. Pat is a voice for global peace and her paintings are created as tools for individual earth and global healing. She draws upon the indigenous sciences of thriving life to reframe questions about sustainability and balance and is devoted to supporting the next generation's women's nation and men's nation in being functional members of the hoop of life and upholding the honor of being human. And we have a number of individuals with high profile and influence in their sectors joining us as listeners, donating the power of their voice and inviting the rest of the world to join them in quietly respectfully and intentionally listening to someone whose wisdom provides vital guidance on how the world can address the slide towards the sixth great extinction. So the format of this will go, Pat is basically going to have the floor and will be sharing from her heart and her soul that that arises in this moment and in this listening. And then towards the end, about 15 minutes before the end, the listeners will be invited to, to ask a question that Pat will be invited to answer in whatever way comes through, and then we will complete. Um, I'm your host, and my name is Claire Dubois. I'm the founder of Tree Sisters. We're a women's social change tropical reforestation organization. We've funded the planting of over 20 million trees across the tropical forest belt. Uh, I'm here because I am a profound lover of Pat and everything that she stands for in this world. Tree Sisters stands at the intersection of consciousness shift, indigenous wisdom, ethical planting, and what it means to shift humanity towards restoration as a norm, towards regeneration as a norm, which basically means rebuilding a reciprocal relationship with nature that is based on respect and reverence. And that is the way of Pat, and that is the way of indigenous nations that we really deeply need to be upholding and protecting at this time. So, Alison Sudol is an American singer, songwriter, actress, music video director. She's known as the singer A Fine Frenzy and also for her role as Queen Gold Queenie Goldstein in the Fantastic Beasts films. Her music has been featured on numerous television shows and in several major motion pictures. We're so grateful that you're here and we're here with one beautiful baby on lap. <laughs> and so we are fully in mothering mode and totally welcome. Thank you, Alison. Thank you for having Wendy me. Wendy Tan White is CEO at Intrinsic, a new alphabet company working to unlock the creative and economic potential of industrial robotics for millions more businesses, entrepreneurs, and developers. A longtime technology innovator, entrepreneur, and investor. She was a vice president at X, a diverse group of inventors, and entrepreneurs who build and launch technologies and companies that aim to improve the lives of billions of people and impact on the world's most intractable problems. Wendy's on numerous boards, including Planet on behalf of Google and a member of the World Economic Forum's 2030 Vision Technology Leaders Group. In 2016, Wendy was awarded an MBE for services, technology, and businesses. Wendy, so grateful that you're here. Thank you for bringing your ear and your heart. 
and obviously for all that you've done, which is extraordinary. And lastly, we have Daniel Growald, who serves as a founder, investor, and partner to people and organizations working to align the power of capital with the intelligence of nature. His founder started startups in the circular economy, digital media, and carbon negative power finance, worked alongside renowned social entrepreneur, Paul Pollock, to commercialize ventures in safe drinking water and village scale renewable energy in India and conducted scientific fieldwork on the intersection of land use, bioenergy, and climate change in Central America. He's a fifth generation descendant of Standard Oil founder, John D. Rockefeller, a trustee of the Rockefeller Fund. Served as co-founder of Bank FWD from its inception until earlier this year when he moved on to pursue the development of climate-centered banking solutions that can effectively serve the needs of high net worth clients and increase the incentives for progress among the existing major banks. Wow, goodness me, I wish I was better at reading. Thank you, David, Daniel, there you go, as well for being here. And I'm just going to invite us all just to take a breath after all those words and to remember why we're here. We're here to listen. We're here to listen deeply from our heart and our souls on behalf of our ancestors, on behalf of all of those who haven't listened to the voices of indigenous people for long enough that we find ourselves in the mess that we're in. We're here because unless listening happens at the very deepest levels to those who know how to live in right relationship with nature, relationship as sacred, indivisible from nature, unless we learn how to listen, it's highly questionable that we will make it through what's coming. We're listening because the quality of our listening calls forth the speaking. The quality of our listening acts as the deepest apology for the wrongs done, the atrocities done on this continent over here, for the ways in which we have gone blind and deaf to what truly matters. And we're listening because it's time to wake up collectively to who and what humanity actually is. And we can do that through our hearts, we can do that through our DNA. And being in the presence of someone like Pat, who speaks with such depth and compassion and honoring and inclusivity, it's a tuning fork for that that exists inside all of us. So my invitation is to put down anything and everything that you're doing to not have this on in the background as you're continuing, but to sit at this sacred table of deep listening and honor Pat, honor Pat's lineage, all those that can speak through her in this moment and those that are still to come. And for us to bear witness and deeply honor you, Pat, and I hand you the floor with all my love. Thank you, my sister Claire. Hmm. So I wanna say uh, greetings to each and every one who has um, been drawn here. I'm gonna say it's no accident that you've, if you find yourself here for this gathering of the five fingered ones to consider who we are and how we're all related to consider who we are, where we are and how it is. Um, I come from Diné Nation, so I'll introduce myself the way that we do and say Shea'iya, Tachi Inishli, Aro Ashi Imbashishchi, Mu'adish Gejne Dasha Nale, Klaus Chi Dao Shiche, Guatao Stani Nishli. So I'm naming uh, I'm naming my clans. And I always like to say, that ain't Latin, baby. <laughs> that is not Latin based, is it? 
So I take great pleasure speaking those sounds, those sounds that have been uh, conceived, received, evolved directly from earth in relationship with earth. It's medicine. And uh, I wanna say that I was also adopted into the Lakota spiritual way of life about 30 years ago. And in that way, I was given the name Wiyakpa Najimi, which translates roughly to womaning, standing, shining. And uh, I'm feeling a lot here. But here's how I'd like to begin. Um, I'd like to begin with a song. So let's hope Zoom will cooperate enough. But even, even if it's a little bumpy, um, it's okay. Uh, the fact that I'm singing it is um, going to affect what happens here and going to affect what, what your experience is and, and me, because I'm also listening. I'm listening. I'm listening to what needs to be said. What is What, it, what, what has to be said now? So I'm going to sing this uh, grandmother calling song. well in this tech tech way um, so grandmothers are here <laughs> they have arrived um, so so I, I I started out by singing um, because like I said, I need to listen. I need to know what needs to be said right now. And um, I'm, I'm, in, I'm as deeply as you might be listening to me, I am listening to them and I am listening to this mother earth to the very best of my ability. 
because what an incredible uh, moment this is, incredible moment. So, um, so I wanna say uh, that uh, I'm gonna start us out with the two foundational things that I often say to help people be able to hear anything else I might have to say. One, I say, if sustainability is the highest and most sought after technology on the planet, who should we be talking to? We should be talking to those peoples who've known how to live in one place over an extended period of time, thousand years, 2000 years, 3000 years, 5000 years, 10,000 years, 20,000 years in relative health, harmony and happiness in, in place. That's what indigenous means, huh? And so that's, that's what we name these people, indigenous peoples. They are of place. They are of place, deeply, deeply of place in a way that modern world has very little understanding of at this time. In modern world, we can pick up our world, our individual world, and move it from LA to Orlando, to London, to Tokyo. No big deal. But what we might not understand about this cult, these cultures of, these indigenous cultures of place is that that's not how it works. So I've been saying that culture is not a human construct. Culture is the mother earth expressing herself as human being in any given place. I'll say that again. Culture is not a human construct. Culture is the mother earth expressing herself as human being in any given place. So in a literal way, our clothing, our, our um, adornments, all, if we stay in the same place, they're limited to a certain, a certain spectrum, I guess you could say, to the plants, to the animals. And so this is why when we really look at indigenous cultures, um, why they're wearing, <laughs> wearing all these things from the earth and from what surrounds them. They're not necessarily, you know, ordering it on Amazon from across the world. You know, they're not, they're not ordering headdresses from across the world. They're, they're, it's coming right out of the, the place, right? So how do you have that kind of a place? How do you have that relationship with place? And how do you end up with that kind of sustainability? To be able to not destroy a place and live there as a human being for thousands of years. So one, I'm hoping that that um, busts us out of the box that, that I feel that we are in, in which we, we I say humanity has, um, low self-esteem right now as a species <laughs> because we have this idea at this moment that everything we touch, we destroy. Not so, not so, not so. That is not inherent in our nature. That's a learned, that's a learned response to certain beliefs and to a certain paradigm that we have agreed upon. So I'm gonna give us uh, one example before I go on to the other, the second foundational thing <clears throat> that I say, just try to set us up. Uh, but you know, this comes from my daughter's work, Lila June Johnston, um, who some of you may know. And um, if you don't look her up, she's next level for sure uh, from her mama. Um, but um, you know, she's, her, she's getting her PhD on uh, traditional land management practices. And so she, she was telling me, gosh, mom, you know what they're finding is so it, they're, they're drilling these uh, and getting earth core samples, right? Um, which, well, I won't go into it. It's a little bit problematic for indigenous people to just go boring holes into the earth that way, just to find, just to see what's there. <laughs> but nevertheless, these are happening. And so what they're discovering, you know, the farther down you go, the farther back in time you go, because the, the sedimentary labor, layers of even human civilization are building up. So if you go down far enough, what you find is there might be only a few different species that you can see and they, they, they track like uh, fossilized pollen samples. And that's how they're noticing what kinds of plants were available at certain times in history. And um, so the farther back, so you might go back, there might be three or four, but then, you, but then if they go a little later, with the, they notice that the arrival of humans has come. And suddenly the uh, number of species of plants that become available just explodes. So that's, that's the scientific aspect of it, right? But what that's saying to me is, um, and what she's, she's studying is that we had ways of land management. I mean, that, that's, that's, a, that's coming from a certain way of thinking. I'm gonna call it right relations and cooperation and collaboration 
with place that allowed us to cultivate and to participate in what kind of life was around us. And the reason that this is not widely known and hasn't really been scientifically known is because we didn't try to conform the land to us. We followed the contours of the land primarily. And also it was a principle for us that if you left evidence of it, if you if you if you've left a mark on the earth in such a way that you would notice it, meant it wasn't in harmony with how everything was growing and being. And our goal was to harmonize. So our goal was not to leave a mark. And this is why the scientific evidence of this has been a little difficult to track, but it, but it's our, our, our current, I'll say crude modern science is catching up with this. So what that says to me is um, we, we knew how to tend and be in relationship with earth in such a deep synergistic, I guess you could say cooperative way. And I wanna point out that the story that's been told and it was told to me in my own U.S. history books. I had to go to U.S. I'd go to high schools and such, and junior high in, in the U.S. And I would be told this history myself as an indigenous person. But the way that story is told is when when those ships arrived on this continent. And it doesn't really matter where they landed, anywhere on this continent, South South America, of what we, what we call now North America. Um, what did they say? Over and over again, they said they couldn't believe their eyes. It was so bountiful. It was so full of vitality. It was fruiting, it was flowering, game was plentiful. And so they kind of described it as, as a kind of Eden, this imaginary place in the human concept of that comes out of the Bible from some time that we don't know, but, but there was this Eden. But what they implied always in, in this was that it was undespoiled by human hands as though we would know if humans had been here because it would be a, a wreck. <laughs> it would be a mess. It would be like what we just left behind when we sailed over here. So that's a way of thinking, right? But the truth is there were millions of people on the continent. Civilizations had risen and fallen over a long period of time. And I also wanna point out that we'd had other visitors. We've had lots of visitors on this continent. But some of them understood that they could come and visit and be a guest and leave. <laughs> and some of them didn't understand that. So I'm gonna rewrite a little history for us here to kind of loosen us up a little and say, wow, what else don't we know? What else have I been told? Okay, so that's part one. Part two is doing a little time check there. Part two is this. Okay, so so how do you, so how did this happen? So what I know in my life is um, that uh, I entered into uh, ceremonial life, Lakota ceremonial life, kind of late in the game, I guess you could say. I didn't it, I, was, I didn't start out being born into it. My grandparents and parents were taken to Dutch Christian Reform missionary boarding schools, and maybe some of you are aware of what's what's being discovered at these residential boarding schools in what we now call Canada. You know, and, and it happened in the United States and Australia and other places all around the world, Africa, um, where that became a part of the practice for trying to, um, we can always lose track of that word anyway, conform um, indigenous peoples into this modern world paradigm way. And so the, an effective way they decided to do that would be to kidnap the children and force them into these schools. Um, and bring them up the way they thought they should be brought up and indoctrinate them into that modern world paradigm way of thinking. Devastating, as you can imagine, devastating. So they're finding mass graves right now. Thousands of children's bodies on the grounds of these residential boarding schools. And you know, this it's not that indigenous peoples didn't know that this was happening. I mean, my, my, my mom, I'm living with my mom right now here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I'm in her house. She she went to one of these boarding schools. Her grand my grandparents did. So I'm the first generation who did not go. So I just want to name that um, that this is very recent. Um, and so uh, uh, 
this is a very big moment for indigenous people because it's one of the first times that that we we've, we've been trying to say this happened this happened this happened hey this happened and we've got it it's fallen on deaf ears hugely families disrupted land stolen through that process but but maybe even more relevant to us at this moment is that that deep science of sustainability was interrupted not only interrupted but in many cases a lot of it has been lost as we've been trying to recover from what took place there and so what that means is the very deepest understanding that humanity holds of how to be on earth has been being systematically rubbed out and that is partly why as claire is pointing to we find ourselves where we are today we have not recognized the science of true longevity in terms of sustainability because of that mindset so so how do you how do you um have this kind of relationship with place well I'm going to point us to this book that one of um, an indigenous scholar uh, wrote that I had a chance to read and it, and it changed everything for me in my life. It was um, Dr. Cajete's, Dr. Greg Cajete's Native Science book. There's a lot of amazing things in there. Uh, but the thing that really got me was this. He, so he was saying, so if we, uh, how, you know, he's reading all these old writings from the ologists, the anthropologists, archaeologists, all those guys. And, um, and he said, Every time they write about us, they always use these words. They, were, they call us primitive and childlike. I wonder what's going on there. Why do they always use those words? And I love this. He didn't go right for the low hanging fruit of what a bunch of racists such and such is. Instead, he said, there is a system of thought going on over there that causes them every time they see us, those words come into their mind. I wonder what it is. So he went to go and investigate. Now this is him looking through his lens, but what he thought he saw was that most of these people who wrote these this, this early writings about indigenous peoples, they were primarily English aristocratic gentlemen, edu well-educated men, right? And, uh, and so as he looked at their culture, he said, maybe if I understand their culture, I would understand why this phenomenon happens. And so what he thought he was seeing is in their culture, up until the age of five, you're allowed to sing, dance, play, pretend to your heart's content. But at the age of five, it's time to get down to the serious business of being the educated man. And at that point, all these other activities become very secondary. And the primary activity becomes this, the honing of the intellect the honing of the intellect. And it remains that way for the rest of their lives. So these men come over on their ships and they get out and step out into Eden <laughs> and, what, and they see us and what are we doing? We're singing, we're dancing, we're having conversations with things you don't believe you can have a conversation with. We're seeing things that they don't see. And so their only conclusion is these must be a primitive people. And even our men are engaged in these activities. So in, in the activities of children from their lands, right? Only children do these things. And so they say, even their men are doing this. So this is childlike culture. Wow. Wow. That blew my mind. I was like, now I know what's going on. Now I know what's going on. I get it. And because then, you know, it changed everything for me because I realized, wow, okay, so that what the flip side of that is what's happening on our side. And on our side, what I'm realizing is we never stop those activities. We never stop those activities. If you're a child that has any access to nature at all, you befriend it, right? You have special places you go, you have special trees you like to sit under. Well, what if that was never interrupted? What if it just kept going and deepening and was reinforced? Your parents go and sit under your favorite tree and tell you why their experiences of sitting under the favorite tree. And then your grandparents, oh, well, I remember when I sat under that tree this one time, you know? So that's a very literal and oversimplified view of what I'm saying. But, but even that, even if we could have pictured that, we can already feel in our bodies how different things would be, right? But, but this goes a little deeper than that. So part of the reason I sang at the beginning, 
was because I wanted us to feel. Everything changed when I sang, even your expectations of how I was supposed to begin. <laughs> She's gonna do what? That all changed. And I just kept going and going. <laughs> We have to sing it four times for the four directions. Didn't she already sing that? Yeah, she already just sang that. Okay, so, um, so you know, all this stuff is changing in the mind, but even in the body, the vibration in the body changes, right? So I just wanted us to notice that it's a little more impactful when we're in person. Um, but but I also wanted us to notice that that's that's the way. And so what I'm saying is the song is a way of knowing, and it's a way of opening up all these fields of perception in the human body the human mind, the human heart, the human spirit. It's engaging the full organism of the human being to open its aperture, to receive and perceive. The song does that. The dance does that. We fast and pray for vision. And what we do when we do that is we open up our aperture to say, I receive from all of this life your input guide me as a human being. I might have a question, or I might just say, spirit, I'm in love. You know, we call it sustainability. I call it a mad love affair with this place that we've been put in. Forget sustainability. Psst. Mad love affair with this place I'm in. I am so in love with this place that I'm in, and mysteries keep unfolding and unfolding and unfolding and unfolding, and I'm into it. I'm so into it. And I'm not only into it by myself as some weirdo in my apartment somewhere, I'm into it with my children, with my cousins, with my mom and dad, with my grandparents, with all of my community and people, we're all into it. We're all into this mad love affair. And my whole community is supporting me to go this out this one time and ask out into this, to this amazing creation. <laughs> this ever unfolding mystery. What is it that you would have me see and know? What else could we be doing here? What more, what more fun could we be having? What other kinds of healing and opening and expanding as a creature on earth can we have? Here, I'm asking, I'm asking. And all of my community is singing me out. And then I go and I sit by myself on the earth and they're staying by the fire, praying for me, laughing, eating meals, going into the sweat lodge, all that support for me. And then they bring me back down after I haven't eaten or drank for four days, bring me in and they sit very politely and they say, well, if you'd like to tell us anything about what happened, we're open to hearing that. <laughs> There's nothing like that. There's just nothing like that. And to be able to come back and tell about what the mystery had to say. And then the community coming together and saying, wow, we feel that, we hear that. How can we support the realization of that vision? That vision that's not a good idea. And I'm gonna tell you, I've had it with, Genius and brilliant ideas. I'm over it, friends. Done. We don't know. We do not know. <laughs> Everything we try to get our little kitty toddler hands in, we muck up when we don't understand who we are, where we are, how it is. So this is why we have practices of opening up to the larger community. I'll say a few words about this symbol here. So this is a Lakota, some people would call it medicine wheel. I like, I always call it the sacred hoop of life. And it's describing the four different directions, which stands for a lot of different medicines we understand comes from each, each direction, cardinal direction. It speaks about the stages of a human being's life from child to young adult, childbearing age, productive time to elderhood, um, stands for, it, it represents so many things about who we are, where we are, how it is. But one of the things it's talking about is, I say every single life form gets to have a seat on this sacred hoop of life. And every single life form is given a way to uphold its part of the hoop. 
if every single organism does not uphold its part, so we get to have a seat on the hoop of life, humanity, but we're not the whole hoop. We get a seat on the hoop, <laughs> okay? Very important. So every single organism has to uphold their part or the integrity of the hoop begins to fail. So science is catching up with this concept, right? They're talking about, you know, the interrelatedness of ecosystem, how, gosh, what happens on one side of the world seems to affect what happens on the other side of the world. Bingo, bingo, bingo. Yes, this is the construct of earth. It's a heck of a spiritual setup because every single being gets to do whatever the heck it wants. It's a free will construct. I mean, look at us. We're doing whatever the heck we dream up. We can do it, but there's a caveat to that. There's a natural boundary which says you might get to do whatever you can dream up to do, but you might not be able to continue to live on earth. So you decide. You decide. Right now we're having a hard time making that decision. Mm, tough one. Tough one. I love doing whatever the heck I can dream up. I love it. I'm addicted to it. Why am I addicted to it? Think about what happened in school. Who was rewarded? Who was rewarded was whoever had the most original, innovative idea. And then whoever that person was, you try to beat them out by having an even more original idea. No sense of context, no sense of interrelatedness, just have the best, biggest, grandest, most original idea. That's what's been being cultivated. But we're bumping into that natural boundary. <clears throat> so going back to this, you know, so every creature gets to have its place on the hoop and every creature I'm gonna say also has a perfect design to uphold its part. But there's another piece to this. So if we're so interrelated, Thich Nhat Hanh calls us an interbeing. If we're so interrelated, here's the thing. And as I look out my window and I see all the creatures outside, plants, dragonflies, anywhere you go, algae, rocks, they all conduct their lives in such a way that the way they live only ever supports every other life form. Amazing. Amazing in this complicated, complex symphony of life. Every single one of them, only the way they live, only ever causes all other life to thrive. They've got the spiritual lesson of what it means to be this interrelated. So who doesn't have that lesson down yet? <laughs> it's us. Now, in modern world science, um, well, and in modern world paradigm, and I'll say a couple words about modern world paradigm before we open it up here. But in, in modern world science, uh, evolution goes like this. We like these vector lines in modern world science. Time only moves one direction. Progress should always be moving up like this, more, better, more, better, more, better, more, better. And so evolution too, we started out with the lowly creatures and we move up to who? To us, we're the pinnacle we think. In indigenous culture, exactly backwards. We say we are the last to arrive and this is logically sound by, in one way too, to say all these other beings have had a chance to figure this out. And that's why they're moving in this harmonious way. But we are the babies on the block. We're the new kids here. And so that's why we consider all the other life forms elders to us. We need to be observing, if we're wise, we're gonna observe how all these other beings go about their life. And they, we say, are compassionate and, and want to show us and teach us how to be here. But because we have this flipped around, we're not really, we're not really in school much these days. So what do I mean by modern world paradigm? I call, I call it modern world paradigm 
sometimes people call it Western civilization, but I don't know. That's, I don't think we have to point any fingers so specifically. <laughs> so I'm just going to call it modern world paradigm. And, um, and, and, and what I see in that modern world paradigm is this, that in order to have what you need, you have to beat something else out. You have to overcome another. That's the setup. And so we've been talking about it, right? So a shape like this is a good shape symbol, symbol for it. All the fruits of the labor are traveling where? To this little tippy tip up here. What is it? 26 billionaires now own half the world's wealth. Um, so it's been moving in that direction. So it might've appeared that this was working to your great grandfather. Your great grandfather had it down. It might've appeared that you're, that your grandfather was doing okay in it. But then maybe for those of us, I'm getting older now, so I have to say your, your father, you might be like, wow, it seems like dad's really struggling over here, or mom. Um, I mean, women are not allowed in this too deeply, by the way. And if they are, it's only if they act in a certain way. We say masculine or patriarchal, but I'm gonna say, so here's something, well, I'll finish with this. And then I got one more thing to say before we open it up. <laughs> so many things to say here um but so in this power over paradigm might makes right and so men are going to dominate in that if you have to beat somebody else out in order to succeed in there men are going to dominate but i'm going to say that for my view men are not the patriarchy the power over paradigm is the patriarchy what we're calling patriarchy we don't even know who men are because they have been so identified with this paradigm and I was told, you, I was told this about masculine and feminine. You think you know what masculine is, but you don't. And you think you know what feminine is, but you don't. All you know is how they behave when you plug them into a power over paradigm. But if you were to plug them into a completely different paradigm, they would behave in a completely different way. And I can say that I know that is true because in indigenous culture, the way, the way gender is viewed and employed is very different than in modern world paradigm. So I wanna say one more thing about this. <clears throat> so all the fruits of the labor traveling up to the top here and all the money being held by a few. What is money anyway? Well, I've been in a really deep study around money for the last three years. So one of my elders says money is the largest and maybe deepest unconscious agreement that humanity has ever made. We made it up. We made it up. And, uh, and so what happens if we start to bring that agreement to consciousness, which I believe is happening in many different ways? We begin to see some things about it. So I want to finish with this uh, little piece here. Uh, there's only one place for money to come from. Earth. Follow it back. Something was taken from Earth that generated cash. And you can move it around so it looks like it's disconnected from Earth, but it came from Earth, friends. Where else could it come from? So it so money is the extraction from earth, from the bodies of men, women, and children, from the bodies of animals, from the body of the ocean, from the body of the trees, from the body of the sky. There's no other place it could have come from. So to withhold that wealth, to hoard that wealth, to hold that money back is actually to withhold life from life. It's the damming up of life. And so if we want to live with all our relations, that's what I said when we were sort of backstage, we do this so the people can live. That's how we enter into all of our ceremonies. We do this so the people can live and we wanna live with all of our relations. If in fact, that's what we would like that life is going to have to get undammed, friends. It has to. So I'm going to stop there and let Claire take it away.
I'm just going to invite all of us actually to take a few deep breaths after that, Pat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pat is ringing a tuning fork of truth, and I wonder what is ringing inside each of us in this moment. We were the last to arrive. We're the youngest here. Cultures that know how to live in sacred reciprocity are considered primitive and childlike, but who exactly is primitive and childlike? Especially if we see things not as they are, but as we are. And we don't know what a man is or what a woman is. We just know how we all show up when we're plugged into a power over paradigm that is the construct of patriarchy. I'm going to invite Alison to ask her question. Alison, are you available? I am available. My baby has just uh, uh, woken up, but um, that was incredible, Pat. Thank you so much for that. That was um, needed and um, just deeply powerful. So thank you so much. Um, I uh, There's so many things that I'd like to ask you. I'd love to just sit down with you for, for uh, quite a long time, actually. But um, I wonder because I, I am one. I am the one of the people that came, the last of the last, and and I don't know where I'm from, in in a in a deep sense that that you have. I don't, I don't have that connection, and I long for it. I yearn for it, and I wonder what, you know, what what advice or what 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 you would say to people like me who are longing for that sense of community. I would love to sit in, in ceremony um, and, and laugh and pray and eat meals and wait for you um, to receive the message. Um, and that's just not something that's readily available to me. Um, what would you say to to those of us who don't have the gift of that, what, what, how could we connect to that without appropriating, without further um, being where we don't belong? Thank you, Allison. Um, so first I wanna bring up something that uh, was kind of, I mean, I kind of understood it, thought I understood it vaguely, but it kind of got spelled out for me the other day and I was just like, wow. And that is this construct of, of white, because I get asked this question with some frequency by many people who identify as being white. So white was something else we, we maybe it's another agreement we made. <laughs> um, white was used to, to create certain political structures so that you know, those who are not white was kind of the idea, but what it ended up doing for those who come from mixed lineages, and in particular from Europe, um, it, it erased lineage and culture by saying, by just calling it white, calling you white. And then, and, and now I'm realizing that as people ask me this, because there's usually a lot of grief when they're asking me this, as they hear about what it's like to come from the lineages that I do, um, uh, I think that this is also, of course, then the root of white supremacy is to say, well, if, if I got disconnected from lineage and I've been given some kind of power in that process, then um, I don't want you to have your culture. I don't want you to have your culture. So anyway, study that. Study where whiteness came from, for one thing, and see what has been done there. It's quite the little trick. But I'm going to say one, Allison, and to anybody else listening, I, it's in much more detail. There's a, there's a YouTube out, and it's called First Ceremony. It's 
called First Ceremony. And I don't know if it's under Pat McCabe or Women Stand Shining, but I'm going to say that it's a human action all over the planet, anywhere you go with all indigenous peoples or humans throughout time to make an offering as this, as that holy star comes up beyond the horizon and to be that child that stands in that conversation between that ancient holy star and this mother earth, that conversation has been going on for a long time. And I say, whatever that father son is saying to mother earth, she likes it. She likes it. Her life is tumbling out of her as a result of that conversation. He knows what to say to her. And so to be that child in that standing in the middle of that passion and that relationship and to inquire, what is it that you would have me know? What is it that I need to say? And, I, and I've been dedicating that to how do I become that being that causes all life to thrive? That's the one I'm working on right now. Thanks, Allison. Thank you so much, Pat. Thank you, Pat, so much. And um, I'm going to call on Wendy, who I can't actually see. Uh, Wendy Tan White, are you there? I can see you, Wendy. <laughs> I, I, okay. Oh, oh, good. Yes, Great. I think it's just the scroll. Um, Pat, look, it's 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 a gift to be able to listen to you. Um, it, it brings up many questions for me. I think. You know, I, just in my lifetime, I've sat between many cultures, I think is the best way to say it. So from, you know, whether it's my parenting heritage, whether it's being raised in the UK, between men and women, between, uh, I've been a technologist for a lot of my life, and an artist, actually, so that there's tensions there. And I, I think of where it's got me to ultimately is thinking, where I really want to feel connected and grounded is just being stripped back into being what's a human being. I think in a way what you're talking about today is that it's like um, it's almost stripping back in some ways the layer the layer of immaturity of us as uh, you know as being this the last the last group if you like to live here on earth thinking not realizing how immature we are actually <laughs> in many senses um, I, th I think my question would be, you know, I'm obviously now, I mean, I literally move around the world to California because I'm a technologist to, to be in the heart of that. And it's, it, the truth is it is a very male dominated um, future innovation based view of the world that on one hand it's trying to, it, it thinks it's trying to help humanity, but also it's helping in some ways cons consume it in that more modern civilization way you're talking about. Um, one of the reasons I was interested in coming in here is how do you actually bring that back? I've always been more about how do you democratize the value of that into the world as opposed to, as you say, have 26 billionaires sitting on the value of that. But how do we bridge that now? So we're, you know, you could argue that the sustainability climate crisis is the biggest, you know, impact now we can see on the world. But this, the technology is still driving, the innovation is still sort of driving the underlying pieces of that. So how do we bridge that together? How do we bridge that group? And it strikes me, I'm, I'm looking at the group here, most of us on this call are women, right? Most of that world is still driven by men. There's something about how we invite that group to have that communication with all of us, not to have it separately. Otherwise, we're not going to bridge this. Um, so anyway, I, I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long question to you is really, how do you feel we can bridge that? And there was something in there, what you said to me about how um, the indigenous people feel about gender. I think you didn't go deeply into that, but I suspect some key is in there in this as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Wow, okay. <laughs> oh, I know there's a lot of that, but, but it's okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with what I could pull out of there coherently for myself. Um, thank you for all of that though. That reflect, there's a lot of reflection in there. Um, so one, I wanna just, I want us to notice that Chief Seattle, I believe it was said, one day they're gonna, realize they can't eat money. And I'm going to say we're getting real close to that day. I mean, the realization should be registering right now. It's not, not deeply enough. But, but, but the day when that really comes to bear is coming hard and fast. Five years max. Five years max. And so, what, so I'm doing a lot of deep work with wealth holders right now. And one of the things that comes up there is to say, at some point here, very soon, my money is actually not going to have any meaning. It's going to become rendered worthless. 
So what can I do with it in this moment that actually matters in the physical world? Because it's still an opportunity to direct energy, to direct attention, to direct um, relationship with earth, I'm gonna say. So not many people just flat out say that out loud, but I feel the need to say that um, out loud. And, um, and so what does that mean? So for instance, you know, on, a, on, a, on one level, like the hurricanes that just blew through Louisiana here, thinking about the fires in Greece, thinking about the fires in Siberia, thinking about the fires in California. Um, I mean, you can run, but you can't hide once you get this engine malfunctioning, or maybe she's functioning perfectly to do what she needs to do. I was told in ceremony that, you know, first world nations are not being hit that hard that we can perceive. They are. Look at all the homelessness. Look at, I mean, there's a lot of suffering going on in, for, in quote unquote first world nations. But it's already been hitting third world nations hard, 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 hard. So they said by the time it really registers with first world nations, it's going to be just about too late. So that realization is really important for us to have as we sit back and look at how much the next tech thing is going to generate financially. You're going to invest in five more years. You're going to withhold life from life as she's screaming out and destroying everything. I mean, it's going, to, it's going to register eventually. So when that happens, what I've been saying to activists is you got to be ready. Like, yeah, we're, 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 de we're declaring what our dissent, which is spiritually extremely important to declare what you consent to and what you don't consent to, because there are spiritual law that comes into play when you do that. When you sit back and give your, you know, they're going to do whatever they want anyway. What difference does it make what I think? Well, it matters in terms of spiritual law, you need to declare, every one of us needs to declare at this moment, I do not consent to the destruction of Mother Earth. I do not consent to the destruction of children, women. We have to name it because that engages spiritual law and, and accounting will come due. We don't get to say when. But um, there's one other piece I wanted to say. I probably don't have time to say it. Uh, I'm available to talk to men. I love talking to men. Men's nation is holy, holy, holy. And I think it is an untapped resource that humanity has yet to employ. Because again, as long as men are associated or are, are, are synonymous with the paradigm, they're hidden. We don't even know what they are, but in our culture, we say that they are protectors of the life bringers, the children and the elders, and that all of their strength, all of those amazing qualities they have, have to be put in the service of life. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Pat. And um, just handing over to Daniel. Daniel, can you unmute, please? Thank you so much, Pat. Oof. so so much in there um, on all of these themes of what it means to be a man what the masculine is service um, so many things the the place your tuning fork resonated so strongly for me is in the mad love affair with life um, that's just like oh that's at the heart of what drives me um, and it's, it's funny connecting back to the theme of what does it mean to be childlike? Um, my childhood, I spent a lot of time running around in the forest and fell madly in love with earth. And I've worked hard to keep that alive. Uh, and as if, if I look around at the world that we're in right now, this modern cultural construct, um, I see a way of things that is so not in love with life, that's so not in love with nature in all of the systems that run this world. And I see how if things were infused with that mad love, then there could be change, then there could be a movement towards the service of life because 
love doesn't have hierarchy. It's just about supporting uh, and receiving. So my question for you is what, what might it look like to infuse that mad love into the system that we're within that seems to have so many safeguards against even feeling love or anything else? What might that look like to infuse it in? <clears throat> might look like Eden. <laughs> um, but um, so let's start. So, so here's, here's my methodology. I, I feel like if we get to the root of our belief, if we get to the, if we get to the root of what paradigm, being able to see the paradigm we operate out of, if we can be that fish that notices the water we're swimming in, that's half the battle. So that's always where I speak to. I'm not in, I don't have a lot of like, uh, now go here, now do this, uh, a little bit, but not too much. So, um, so I'm going to say that the first thing that I would have us notice is that paradigm is a choice. Paradigm is a choice. And that's what the holy people said to me. They said, do you know you guys can have it any way you want it? You know that? You can have it any way you want it. And right now you're saying you want it like this. But you can have it any way you want it. So I, I saw this great meme, which was, I forget how the beginning of it goes, but basically it's addressing this. We can have it any way we want it. And right now we choose white supremacy and credit scores. I just thought, wow. <laughs> so true, or or whatever. So, you know, so in that in that power over paradigm, um, it's completely driven by intellect. So that that was the first thing. And that's why I bring up the point that I made. Uh, I, I always tell people, try having a mad love affair from intellect only. Tell me how it goes. <laughs> So it's hard for us to have that mad love affair with anything, as long as we've been like, like so deeply, systematically, methodically, emphatically um, driven to the intellect only way with an aperture like this. When our full human capacity, as we can witness in many different peoples around the world, it can be like this, right? So that's why I bring that up is to say, um, man, uh, I mean, we, I'm not saying we don't need intellect at all. We do. But I say when it's like they say, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. When all you have is an intellect, <laughs> everything looks like a problem to be solved or things to be categorized or trouble to shoot or, you know, it's, it's a very specific modality. But it actually doesn't really engage all that well with earth. So many things we have chosen in a, randomly, I'll say, but I, I think we've been guided into it actually quite carefully. But, but we could say random in the sense that we could choose anything. Um, have we been guided into uh, to not be able to have this relationship with earth? So I, my, that's why I really point to go out and make those offerings. There is a lot out there that is really waiting for us to ask and only some of us are asking. <laughs> but the rule is, from what I understand, is if you ask, that answer is going to come. I always say, make sure you're asking for that which serves light, because lots of things can come and answer. Um, but but um, to go out and make that offering and submit yourself, I mean, submit, you know, that's how it looks from modern rule paradigm view in which you have to be powerful. But submit yourself to all of this intelligence of life around us. Submit yourself, and for me, submit myself to the spiritual helpers that have been here, that my people have known for so long. So um, that's what I tell the young people. And, um, one, I tell them, you've got to want your life. You've got to want your life like this. Want it. Mm. You've got to want it. Whatever it is that makes you want your life like that, that's where you need to go. And how, and so that, that points to something else. Your joy is your compass. How different would our lives have been? No one ever said that to me. If someone had said, 
Your joy matters. Your joy matters. Everything else matters, but we don't say that to our young people because we're setting them up for a life where, you know what, you're probably not going to have that much joy. So let's just don't talk about it. In this incredible creation of mystery and magic, sorry, you might not have that much joy. Outrageous. Claire's telling me I better pull it up here. Do you know how much I don't want you to stop, Pat, but I'm aware that the <laughs> webinar is literally going to close on us in, in less than almost two minutes here. So I just want to actually have the opportunity to thank you, to thank you deeply for the wisdom that you've brought, to thank you for giving us some paradigm shifting perceptions and reflections. I think the best thing that all of us can do is to realize that we have no idea what we are or who we are. And that in moving into radical humility, then perhaps those that were here long before us can help us realize what the opportunity is and what a human being even is. I want to thank um, Alison and Wendy and Daniel for coming and asking beautiful, insightful questions for your deep listening. To all of you that have been here, what matters to me is that Pat's voice and Pat's wisdom gets to get out into the world. So as soon as this becomes available, I'm gonna ask each and every one of us to find as many ways as we can of getting this out, to give it wings, to give her wings, to get the information and the invitation out because we're lost, but we have a chance of being found. And frankly, the best thing about being lost is being found or finding yourself because it means that everything that we've taken for granted we no longer need to take for granted. We get to grab onto our lives and live as if life actually matters because we've forgotten. Life actually matters. Life deeply matters who we get to be with each, for ourselves and for each other and for the children, for all of our relations deeply matters. Pat, bless your heart. Thank you so, so much for everything, for your journey, for being willing. Did, you, did everybody hear her? Men of power, Pat is ready to talk to you. She is ready to help you remember who and what you are. And may we give Pat's wisdom wings. May we let that tuning fork ring inside us. May we be changed. May, be, may we be willing to change and may we fall in love and move our money in the next five years while it still has capacity to do something for life. Let it be life unleashed on behalf of life. 10 seconds to go. Bless you. Thank you all. Thank you to, uh, thank you to everyone. Take good care. You were born into beauty as beauty for joyful life. You were born into beauty as beauty for joyful life. That's the truth.